When we were all sent home from work in spring 2020, I decided to start a YouTube channel. As a computer guy who loves tech, I may have gone a little overboard for a new channel just starting out. Welcome back to Ben's Tech Lab. Today, I'm gonna to take you on a behind the scenes tour of my YouTube studio, including all the tech that makes YouTube so much fun. It's no secret that starting a YouTube channel can be easier with a little bit of a capital investment. You want a nice camera, a nice microphone, some decent lighting, but it's not long before you want a second camera and a top down camera. And then, well, you get the idea, it just keeps going. My tax person has basically told me that I'm guaranteed to be audited because I spent a lot of money on equipment last year and only made about a thousand bucks from YouTube. But that's just the nature of YouTube. It requires some upfront investment of both capital and time. And then hopefully after a few years, you get enough momentum that it takes off as self-sufficient and cash flow positive. It's tempting to start with cameras and such, but really let's just take a look at the room. The area you see on YouTube is only about 10 feet by 10 feet. The room is actually a fair bit longer than this, but I've got doors and windows on all four walls that make it hard to arrange. You'll notice that I've got Ikea curtains along the back wall, which conceal one of the windows. Windows can mess with the lighting of your shots and or distract users watching the video. Also, the curtain helps reduce reverb in the room and improve the audio. The floor is already carpeted in here, which is good for audio and foot warmth, but it's hard to roll things around on wheels. So I have this big chair mat under my whole desk and have obviously tried to minimize the number of stands in my room. You can see at the top of the wall, I painted some two by eights white and screwed them into the studs. My thinking is that it's way easier to fill some screw holes on a flat wall than it is to repair a textured ceiling. Below the two by eights, you'll see I've got some cork wall tiles, which have some aesthetic appeal, while also said to absorb sound better than a flat wall. Using these two by eights on either side of the room, I've run some black aluminum pipe across the room to make a pipe grid. I don't have any light stands in this room at all. They all hang from the pipe grid, but not just lights. I have my top down camera mounted up there as well as my main microphone. I've even got a pull down Elgato green screen for zoom backgrounds. Now I do have one C-stand in the corner, which is clamped to the pipe grid. I run all my wires up and down the C-stand and can bungee cord the wires to the C-stand for support. This C-stand is also holding what is currently my key light, a Godox VL150 with an aperture lantern modifier. The VL150 is quite nice as it's fanless up to about 40% brightness, which is enough for my small space. I've got a bunch of other Godox lights too. I've got the larger FL150R, which is a one by four foot LED light panel. It's quite low profile and sits over my desk area at minimum brightness just to make sure that overhead shot looks nice. I've also got two FL60 LED panels, which are also low profile, which I'm using as fill light and hair light depending on the camera angle. I think there's room to improve my studio lighting yet, but this is what I've been using so far for my primary lighting. For practical lights, I've got an Elgato light strip along the back edge of my desk facing the wall, as well as a newer RGB light behind my PC tower in the corner, kind of splashing light up onto the wall. I've also got an Aperture B7C bulb in the lamp on my shelf as a flicker-free light bulb that looks great on video. Last but not least, I've got a Godox RGB light to splash some color on my gray Ikea curtains in the background. Because of the small room size, it's hard to get a lot of separation between myself and the background and some contrasting color I think looks nice. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, hit the like button and consider subscribing. Let's move on to cameras. My main cameras are two Sony A6400 APS-C cameras. And then I have two more Sony A6000s that I bought cheap used off Facebook Marketplace for extra angles. My B camera off to the side over here is mounted to the wall. I screwed one of those bathroom handlebar things into the wall, which lets me easily clamp on super clamps, batteries, cameras, and whatever I need for a second camera angle. The Sony cameras have pretty good autofocus, which is handy when you're filming all by yourself. I started out my earliest videos with kit lenses. I then bought a Sigma 16 mm and 30 mm pretty quick, but I found the 30 mm Sigma had a fair bit of focus breathing. So eventually I took the plunge and bought a couple of Sony G Master lenses, 16 to 55 mm f 2.8. And wow, those are impressive with faster, cleaner autofocus and constant f 2.8 throughout the zoom range. Early on, I got frustrated managing SD cards and syncing up clips and such. So I bought the ATEM Mini Pro ISO and then later the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO from Blackmagic Designs. Both of these boxes can record four or eight HDMI video sources simultaneously to one SSD with two extra stereo audio tracks all synced up and ready to edit. These ATEMs can also do camera switching for live streams and much more. The ATEMs also influenced my journey with audio equipment as well. I first got a Rodecaster Pro, which is a nice all-in-one mixer and recorder aimed mostly at podcasters. 
It has been great to get started and is the ideal mixer if you're just starting out and want one thing to handle all your audio. However, eventually I wanted a bit more control of some of the details in the EQ, and so I started switching over to a DBX-286S mic preamp, compressor, and noise gate, plus inserting a Rolls parametric EQ to notch out some of the room acoustics and control my low-end roll-off precisely. I had tried a 31-band EQ from DBX, but the Q width for each frequency is too wide for pinpointing room acoustics. It's better for broader EQing, and I'm not using that 31-band EQ right now. You'll see a few other things in my equipment rack here, a Blackmagic multi-dock, which can hold SSDs while recording videos, and then hot swap those SSDs to my computer for editing. Then of course, my Raspberry Pi rack mount. This runs my BitFocus companion software, which lets me control my studio using this Elgato Stream Deck. I'm also working on controlling my room lights and bathroom fan using Home Assistant on another Raspberry Pi. And I'm developing a top secret project for YouTubers and live streamers using one more Raspberry Pi. Off to the right of the rack, you can see I did get an M1 Mac Mini this year. Their performance is just so impressive for the price point when you consider that any respectable NVIDIA graphics card was being sold for the same price or more throughout 2021. The Mac Mini runs my live stream graphics software with H2R Graphics V2 as well as OBS to output graphics through the Blackmagic Ultra Studio. The Ultra Studio is something like a graphics card, except it doesn't actually do the rendering, it's more of an output device that supports transparency in video. Alpha channel. Let's keep going down the desk here. I got this fancy dock for my iPad Pro, which has all the connections you could want on it for reliable live streaming, including wired ethernet network and full-size HDMI out. My plan is to use the Mix Effect app on the iPad Pro with wired ethernet, but also the iPad's multi-purpose. I wanted an iPad Pro with the new pencil to help with YouTube thumbnail editing. My main monitor is currently a Dell U2720Q, which is a full 4K with these nice thin bezels on it. On either side of the monitor, you can see my Audio Engine P4 passive speakers, which are powered with the SMSL audio amp over there. My thinking is that standards like USB connectors and Bluetooth change so often that having passive speakers lets me swap out the amp over time as standards keep evolving. This amp also has a front-mounted headphone port for my Bose QC15 noise-canceling headphones for when I need to drown out the noise of kids upstairs and get some work done. I have two different video editing control surfaces here. I started with the Shuttle Pro V2, which was fantastic, but when Blackmagic released their speed editor, which included a license for DaVinci Resolve Studio, I grabbed one of these. The speed editor does have a higher quality jog wheel, which is nice, but it only works with DaVinci Resolve. The last thing here on my desk is my Shure SM7B mic, which is mounted on an OC White Ultima low profile boom arm. The SM7B is a dynamic mic and really rejects background noise while I'm at the computer for a zoom call. It's also my voiceover mic. While we're talking audio, I better go back to my ACAM microphone choices. I started out with a Deity V-Mic D3 Pro, which is a fantastic microphone for someone starting out who needs one mic to do everything. It's even decent for voiceover after you're done shooting your ACAM with it. But in an indoor studio setting, the 3.5mm connection isn't ideal for running longer distances. You want XLR here. And then recharging caught me a few times where the mic had run dead and I only had a small window of time to film. I wanted something that was XLR phantom powered for inside the studio. And because I have some reverb in the room, I ended up settling on the Sennheiser MKH-50 condenser microphone. This is not really a shotgun mic, it has no interference tube on it, but if you can afford to have more than one mic for YouTube, this is an amazing indoor dialogue mic. Because this room is long and narrow, I still have some reverb in here, which is why I built these two sound blanket stands. These sound blankets can be moved around, but basically I just put them on either side of my camera and behind the mic to cut down on reverb. You'll also notice my A-cam is set up with a teleprompter here. I'm still getting used to using this. Most of my earlier videos were just out of my head. This is a Prompter People iPad teleprompter that I fitted with a Lilliput A11 LCD monitor. This appears to be the sweet spot between price and capabilities. Over here to the side of my camera, you can see I have a large monitor that shows all my cameras in a multi-view. This lets me check on everything while recording or streaming to make sure all the cameras are still on and in focus and the audio is flowing through. I've got big plans for my YouTube space this year, but I wanted to capture what the studio looked like now so everyone can follow along on my journey. If I miss something or you want to know more, drop a comment down below. While you're down there, consider subscribing if you haven't already. Until next time, this is Ben, signing off.